Right, good morning, everybody. It's just gone 11 o'clock, so let's get this show on the road. Uh, I'm sure most of you must know me by now, but for those that don't, I am Matthew Reed. I'm another one of the senior analysts here at Quoted Data. Um, James is enjoying a well-earned rest this week, so I'm going to take you through some of the sort of highlights of this week's news in the land of investment trusts, and then I'm going to bring on Richard Aston of CC Japan Income and Growth to talk about his strategy. Um, so I say this week, there were a lot of lot of results out. I think obviously a lot of houses are trying to get things done before the end of the year. Um, there's a sort of common theme running through most of them. That is that obviously it's been a very difficult year in most markets and yeah, absolute returns just generally are, are down sort of everywhere you look. Um, and so we've got a lot of these on the website and I suggest you have a sort of look at those and uh, Pull out, any, pull out anything sort of interesting you like. Um, obviously, a lot of that sort of quite data is the things that I sort of wanted to focus on um, for the show, at least, um, is that we've had a sort of an update from Home Reads. Um, you probably remember we had sort of our analyst, Richard uh, Williams, the last sort of few weeks has been sort of talking about the sort of short seller attack there. We've had an update from them. I just wanted to cover that off. Um, also wanted to talk about Aberdeen Property Income. Uh, you may remember we had the manager of that, Jason Bagley, on the trust just about six weeks ago, um, and we sort of gave us a good run through. But there was a, an issue with the debt, which he talked about, and uh, they've done something with that again. Um, so I just wanted to go over that. And we've had some sort of first or first set of results from Foresight property or Forestry or Sustainable Forestry, and I thought they were a look. So first of all, home read. Um, just a sort of very quick recap, because say we've covered some of this in some detail before. Um, and so you can see the sort of previous videos of it, and there's plenty of news on our website. But just a sort of a quick recap. Um, Home Read has basically been under attack from short seller Viceroy Research since November. Um, you may remember these are the same guys that sort of went after Civitas social housing. Um, similar sort of circumstances not that long ago. Um, so there were sort of two key charges that were leveled at uh, home and one was sort of relating to the financial weakness of their tenants and whether they were going to be able to pay and whether the sort of income was sustainable etc cetera, etc cetera. um the other one that was perhaps you know a sort of more damning was that they were being accused of artificially inflating property prices ergo the nav in their accounts now um hope Home came out and they sort of future those allocations sort of very strongly um but there was a sort of knock-on effect and this wasn't home reads fault, but when you've got this sort of attack, um, the auditors are required to do more work. So the home's annual results should have come out on the 28th of November, I believe it was, but basically the end of last month, and they have been delayed and home's got no choice. So um, they obviously haven't sort of rested on their laurels. They put out a sort of full rebuttal on 30th November, issuing or sort of addressing all of the points raised um, in sort of uh, each of the charges made against them. Um, but they actually put up, let's say, a further update on Monday this week, and I just wanted to talk through some of that. Um, just to give you some sort of context, um, this is sort of what home share price has done and what it's sort of NAV done. This is obviously taken from our website, but um, obviously we get to sort of get a new update on the NAV. So, you know, market conditions that may or may not have come down, we will, we will find out. I mean, obviously a lot of things have come off and I think this sort of first leg here in September, November, that's obviously general market moves. This is much more related to the short seller attack. But I think the key thing that I sort of take away from looking at this is, you know, not long ago, um, this was sort of trading up above 120 and today it's sort of sub 40p. So it's sort of more than a third um, of its value now. If Viceroy are correct, then you sort of maybe that's fair. Equally, um, they may have overdone it. Um, if home, as they say, they have got their house in order, of course, there could actually be some decent value here. So, you know, perhaps something to think about. Um, in this sort of latest update, the sort of first thing that home has done is he has re reiterated that all the allegations are without substance. Um, the income looks good. There's a dividend of 1.38p is declared. So that basically brings us to 5.5p for the year, um, which means that it's achieved its dividend target for the second year running. Um, as I sort of mentioned before, it has been required to carry out these enhanced audit procedures. Um, so the results are delayed. Um, we are going to get these from what they're saying in January, no later than the end of January. Um, 
this has obviously created a bit of a sort of shake up. And one of the things they say is that this has sort of caused unnecessary and significant disruption and losses to the company and its shareholders. And if you look at the sort of chart I showed you a moment ago, I mean, that's quite obviously the case. Um, it is taking steps to enhance shareholder value. And I thought these were the things that were sort of really worth having a look at. So the advisor says that it is committed to invest materially in further resourcing its dedicated in-house team. So there's an in-house team at sort of Alvarium Home Read Advisors that manages this fund. Um, and it looks like, you know, if you sort of look at the, the team roster on the website, there's sort of quite a few people there. Um, but I think, you know, it looks like it would benefit from, from some more experience. I think this is possibly sort of one of the things that has fallen out of this, and they're, they're going to address that. And um, there's going to be some senior hires to work alongside the fund managers, Charlotte Fletcher and Alex Baker. Um, Charlotte's been cutting short-term maternity leave, so she's going to be returning in January. I'm not quite sure when she was originally coming back, but anyway, she's going to be back soon. Um, they're also going to appoint at the advisor's cost an experienced and specialist national property management firm. Um, and they're going to provide a wide suite of property management services to the company, which obviously, you know, I think a lot of this is being done in-house. So hopefully it's going to professionalise some of that and also, you know, give greater visibility and accountability. Um, but they say this is going to include rent invoicing, um, rent collection, liaising with tenants and just monitoring the whole process. Um, other things that it has said in this latest update is that the advisor has reiterated that it does not have any non-standard connections or conflicts with developers that it acquires assets from, um, which I sort of think is to be expected. This is sort of one of the things that has been uh, sort of set against them. Um, so I think you know, hopefully that is comforting. Uh, they have also recognised that actually this attack not surprisingly, exactly the same way that it did for Civitas, it has generated some additional costs that are required to try and rebut and address these allegations, which, you know, are, are serious. Um, the advisor is going to basically pick up the cost of the additional reporting, so there's going to be sort of no impact on home from that, which I think is obviously good news for shareholders. Um, they have also undertaken a review of skills at board level, and they're going to be recruiting an additional non-exec director and this person is going to have a focus on direct property experience and ESG matters and you can expect an announcement in January 23 on that. Um, just maybe on that sort of point I just wanted to have a look at the board which currently numbers four and I think one of the issues here is this has grown um, substantially I mean I think it's only sort of been around a sort of couple of years and yeah, it's, it's proved very popular and it's been able to come back and tap the market and it is now a sort of FTSE 250 company. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps some of the structures that worked when it was smaller, you know, when you sort of grow at the rate that it has that actually, you know, you need to sort of strengthen those. Um, but if you look at the sort of current board, you've got Lynn Fenner. Um, she has considerable property experience. She's sort of CFO and CEO of Verum Perrick Student Property, but has also plenty of other property experience in the space. Simon Moore, He's the sort of senior non-exec director, the senior Ned. He's got a sort of strong investment trust background. He's chairman of the Property and Infrastructure Forum at the AIC. He's a well-known name in the space. He's well-known to, to us here. Um, Peter Caldwell, UK government special advisor, various roles, but has worked for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. And then inevitably, you've sort of got uh, somebody with, you know, accountancy experience, and that is Marlene Wood, who's a chartered accountant. Um, I think, you know, a sort of board of four, probably for a company of this size, they just, just need more resource. And I think, you know, addressing this is actually you know, good and pertinent at the current time. Um, just to sort of bring you back to what I was saying, that if these measures you know, do work, and if actually Home Re has always had its house in order, you know, there's potentially a sort of big gap here. Um, you sort of see in the discount chart at the bottom, it was sort of training around par for a long time. It's been pushed out to, you know, circa, actually, I think I've got it on the next page. Yes, 67% discount, which is, you know, the highest in the section. I think one of the interesting things is, is that it's on a colossal yield. And as we sort of saw um, from the dividend announcement, that looks like maybe it's sustainable. This, this could possibly be good value. We're just going to have to watch the space. But I think it is interesting that, you know, the two, funds that have been targeted by rice, rice, rice sorry, sorry, are, you know, the behemoths of the space. 
Um, they are the sort of ones that have made it into the FTSE 250. And um, we're on the, the sort of cusp there. And that's sort of one of the things that has been raised with these is that um, if you've got something about the market, you can sort of force um, people into a sort of selling position, as it were. Um, the index tracking funds that follow the 250 that may have bought it are sort of forced to, to sell as well. And this you know, can create sort of potential additional balance. You've just got those sort of flows going in your direction. So anyway, um, food for thought on home. Um, say so Aberdeen Property Income Trust next. Um, as I was saying before, it's managed by Jason Bagley. Um, it's focused on UK commercial real estate assets. It's got a sort of diversified portfolio. It's got industrial office, retail, and other sectors. It's got decent inflation protection built into its leases. Um, when we last looked at it, it had a sort of low LTV, I think it was circa 20%. Um, Jason has sort of proved quite forward thinking. A um, couple of sort of things he's done that sort of been successful. Um, was this providing sort of turnkey solution type office suites, um, all sort of fully fitted with modern modern cons, very, very easy um, for the sort of lessors that were just to come in and um, sign up. And it's worked, it's worked very, very well in terms of sort of getting their vacancy rates down. And the other thing that sort of stood out, and I'll perhaps come back to this a little bit later, um, is that thinking ahead, um, property as an asset class is often charged as being sort of very carbon intensive. Um, and so sort of Jason bought this uh, piece of open moorland in Scotland with the idea of reforesting it to sort of capture carbon credits. And he thinks the sort of value of those are going to go up in time. Um, anyway, we had, um, oh, actually, I suppose just before I look at that, um, just a few sort of stats on it, you know, like a lot of other things in the property space. Very decent yield here. Um, a bit of ongoing charges and you know approaching a sort of 50 percent discount so you know something sort of worth looking at and you could just see the same kind of pattern here once again it's drifted out to a to a big discount um now when we had jason on the show on the 4th of november one of the things that sort of came out was that they had recently refinanced their debt um and at the time the sort of market was quite volatile, it moved quickly, and I'll explain when I've got the subsequent slides up, but they quickly realised that they'd actually not done that at a good rate, and that it was, you know, sort of hampering the trust, and clearly, you know, I think the managers were quite concerned about this, and they have announced they refinanced it again on what appeared to be, you know, markedly superior terms, um, and I just wanted to talk people through those. So, as I said, they refinanced those 12th October. It was the height of bond market volatility following the mini budget. Um, at that point, they put in a term loan of 85 million for three years, subject to a margin of 150 bits over Sonia. But the sort of real killer in a way was the interest rate swap um, that accompanied it. Um, this gave them an all in cost of 6.97%. You yeah, know, it was pretty close to 7%. Um, and this wasn't on all of the portfolio, but it was only for sorry, a, a relatively small proportion but um that sort of all in cost was higher than the prevailing sort of weighted average yield on the portfolio so you know it's not something that you would necessarily choose or sort of want to do and as i say it was certainly causing jason some consternation now fast forward um and they have broken the swap arrangement um to do this there's been a one-off cost of you know 3.56 million that's going to be charged against the income account in q4 of this year um what they've done in sort of breaking that, they've replaced the swap with an interest rate cap. So you've preserved the sort of previous 150 basis points over Sonia that was agreed, um, but there's now an interest rate cap of 3.96%. Um, if you look at the sort of current Sonia rate of 2.92%, APR will pay 4.42% on the term loan. Um, the sort of cost of putting this cap in place is 2.51 million, but that's going to be spread out over the sort of three year life of the loan. Um, I think the sort of key things to take away from this, obviously there are upfront costs to doing it, as I've sort of mentioned, um, but what it will mean is that if interest rates continue to fall, then the sort of trust should benefit equally, you know, if inflation 
keeps on moving up and interest rates rise sort of significantly from here, um, there's protection in that environment. Um, the sort of worst case scenario is that if sort of Sonia should increase, you could end up with a maximum all in finance rate for the term loan, which is capped at 5.46%, which I think is sort of pretty close to the weighted average yield on the portfolio. So, you know, still a lot more profitable when you're going to be generating income on it. Um, next thing I wanted to look at was foresight and sustainable forestry. Now, this is sort of one set of results that came out this week. I just picked these out because they say they're their first set and there was some interesting potential takeaways and read through to other things. So um, let's say this covers the sort of first period, which is 31st of August last year to the 30th of September, um, which obviously incorporated the listing in November last year. Um, so when it came to market, it raised 130 million. It followed this up in June this year with another 45 million raise. Um, and if you sort of look at what it's sort of starting NAV, et cetera, is after cost, you end up with a sort of total return of 7%. If you actually just take the you know, issue price, you end up with a 5% return. But the thing that I found really interesting was a sort of key driver in the um, for sort of NAV development was a 16.9% upwards revaluation of its afforestation sites, um, which sort of made me wonder with um, Aberdeen property income, which we we're just talking about, you know, whether there's a potential read through for that. But either way, um, that's sort of quite a, a chunky uplift. Um, and it's sort of quite interesting to see what has actually driven that. So one of the things they say is that evaluations for established forest or forest sites, um, so it's mature forest land, et cetera, um, it's remained relatively muted, so it's not really mute or moved a great deal. However, um, the sort of kind of assets they've got, so you know, land suitable for forestation, actually have moved up quite a bit. Um, and also, you know, in terms of what they're doing, they've been able to build additional valuation uplifts where they've been able to secure the necessary grants, plan information where required, and actually get going on the planting. Um, they say they've got a pipeline of you know, up to 25 further assets, that could reach the sort of planted milestone in, two, in the next two years, which obviously could build in a you know, decent chunk of NAV growth, which they expect to happen. Um, the other thing that they're sort of very excited about is that they sort of have received their first carbon credits, which was obviously what this was all about. Um, and the sort of value of that is now if reflected in the NAV, but presumably if they carry on to grow and do this, they will get more carbon credits and obviously be building those in. Um, Sort of interestingly, this is a share price chart and NAV chart, once again pulled from our website. Um, this was sort of trading at quite a sort of decent premium, but obviously in recent markets, this has come right off. And actually it's sort of still trading around par, um, pretty mostly just a mild premium, um, but obviously it's looking, looking much better value. Um, but obviously this is now sort of much more akin um, to perhaps where the market thought it was going to be in terms of the carbon, carbon credits, obviously they're now sort of factored in. Um, on the sort of negative side, this is perhaps something worth remembering, particularly when you look at sort of history of some of these types of forestry funds. Um, timber prices have softened over the year. Uh, key drivers of this have been extreme weather events, such as Storm R1 and, and you know, if forests, et cetera, globe, get blown down it just creates additional supply it is that simple um the other side is or other sort of factor here is that um the you know, sawmills and you know, other elements of the supply chain are um destocking as well um and they basically say because of all of this they are delaying harvest or harvesting a number of their properties uh the reason that they are doing this is they are aiming to maximize value by bringing the stuff to market when the prices are firmer. And this is sort of something we've seen before. I and mean, they sort of call it, you know, keeping the wood on stump. Um, and that can be sort of done for, well, indefinitely, really. But of course, you know, you're not really earning a return while you're doing it. So that can have an impact over the longer term. So just something to watch, really. Um, okay. 